Well, or maybe we will be in a minute. Okay. Um, let me just start and people are still joining in. Um, so, uh, good evening or afternoon or morning, depends where you are, Ramadan Karim. Uh, thank you all so much for joining us for this online gathering uh, to commemorate uh, Nakba Day, to call for Palestinian return and for a future of justice and peace in Palestine. My name is Rachel Betarie and I'm the director of Zohot. Uh, if you don't know us, um, you are welcome to follow us on Facebook or Twitter or go on our website to learn about our work to push Israeli society to take responsibility for the Nakba and to acknowledge the right to return. Uh, we will talk about this right this evening, not just as an abstract, but as a political necessity in a future that we need to be building together. We have an incredible lineup of speakers tonight that I will introduce in just a moment. And uh, we gather every uh, Nakba day, of course, but this year we gather here today uh, in a time um, of great confusion and tectonic change in the world that uh, rattles every one of our lives, no matter who or where we are. Uh, but that has the harshest effect on the most vulnerable, Palestinian refugees among them. The pandemic that's a direct threat to health and lives in refugee camps in Gaza makes it even more urgent to talk about the plight of Palestinian refugees. But this unprecedented state of the world also makes it urgent to push for the solution to the refugee problem and for justice to be done in the form of return. Um, I reread today an article uh, that is uh, now famous and much quoted by one of my fav favorite writers, uh, Arundhati Roy, uh, who was witnessing from her home in Delhi uh, a devastation brought not so much by the virus itself, but by cruel, oppressive, racist policies, just as we witnessed here by the Israeli government and many of you do in your countries. And Roy writes this, coronavirus has made the mighty meal and brought the world to a halt like nothing else could. Our minds are still racing back and forth longing for a return to normality, trying to stitch our future to our past and refusing to acknowledge the rapture. But the rapture exists. And in the midst of this terrible despair, it offers us a chance to rethink the doomsday machine we have built for ourselves. And as I was reading this, I was thinking this is a feeling really familiar to me. My whole Zionist upbringing in Israel was, still is, in a state of refusing to acknowledge the rupture, the historical and ongoing crimes uh, that's in the foundation of our lives here. Our work at the Hot is a work of acknowledging, of showing the crack to people in our communities and to urge them to face it. Because without seeing it, we cannot move forward to amending and to reimagining our world beyond occupation and colonialism. And Roy continues like this, nothing could be worse than return to normality. Historically, pandemics have uh, forced humans to break with the past and imagine the world anew. This one is no different. It is a portal, a gateway between one world and the next. We can choose to walk through it, dragging the carcasses of our prejudice and hatred of our dead ideas behind us, or we can walk through lightly with little luggage, ready to imagine another world and ready to fight for it. Um, we have with us tonight some incredible people ready to imagine and to fight for another world. 
and I can't wait to hear from them. Uh, we will hear from Dr. Osama Tanus uh, on erasure of history and the making of medical knowledge. We will hear from Dr. Bram Whisperway on why Palestinian health is linked to the liberation. We will hear from Oran Barir um, about a vision, the Zohot's vision, the vision for a Terran and the opportunity to make it a reality. Uh, and last but not least, we will be joined by Remy Kenazi, a Palestinian American poet and organizer who will read to us from his work. Uh, we also want to hear from you. Uh, so please, if you have questions, uh, enter them in the chat box so uh, we can see it and come back to you later. We will start with uh, Dr. Osama Tanus, a specialized pediatrician working in Haifa, uh, a clinical and educational instructor in the Ruth and Bruce Rappaport Faculty of Medicine in the Technion, a master's in public health student in Tel Aviv University, and a researcher in the Galilee Society, the National Society for Health Research and Services. Osama is a 2020 candidate for a Fulbright Hubert Murphy, Hubert Humphrey, sorry, fellowship in public health and health policies. His research interests are in structural violence and health disparities. Osama, please, we're so happy to have you here with us. Hi, uh, Rachel. Thank you. Uh, thank you for uh, inviting me and thank you for the audience. Can you hear me well? Yeah? Yeah, very well. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So, uh, okay, thank you for the audience for joining. Uh, you must be wondering why are medical doctors addressing, uh, addressing you now? Uh, besides the, the pandemic, what do we have to offer? What can, uh, what can we contribute to the discourse about, uh, about the Nakba history, memory, and the right of return? Uh, so I think me and Bram will try to address uh, some of the, uh, the challenges in, in medical, uh, also knowledge production and medical practice uh, in a way that is uh, integrated and organic to the, uh, uh, to the social problems and the political uh, roots of, uh, of many of the health problems uh, that are just another, uh, another mirror of the political, social, and economic livelihood of indigenous populations in Palestine and around the world. So I will, uh, I will share uh, my screen and start with a few slides, and then we can continue the conversation. Um, Wait, my, uh, my screen is uh, freezed. Richard, can you allow me to share my screen? Richard? Yeah, just a moment, we're trying. Okay, this should work. Okay. No. So, oh, I'm not sharing my screen. They get out and log in. Did Wait, allow me to log it? out and log in again for in a moment because no, I can, think I, you can unshare it and share it again. Like you can stop the share. No. Wait, I will log out and then.
Osama? Okay, so uh, can you see me and hear me? Yeah, we can see the screen as well. Yeah. Okay, good. Uh, so, uh, uh, as Edward Said have said and repeatedly shown us in culture and imperialism and many of his uh, works, that all knowledge is uh, about human society is a historical knowledge, and therefore it relies on judgment and interpretation. It doesn't mean that facts do, uh, do not exist, but facts are a, are a product of who is producing them, who is reading them, and how do we interpret uh, and uh, inter interpret them, and how do we see what to do with them or judge them. So uh, I will give uh, two points in history as an example of how knowledge is produced, how medical knowledge in, is produced, and what kind of violence that it can uh, it can have within it, and what kind of uh, violence it can reproduce or try to, to challenge. So in, uh, in 1848, uh, another pandemic was happening. Uh, it was uh, the typhus uh, epidemic was happening in, uh, uh, in an eastern part of, uh, of, uh, of then Borussia, Germany, in a border between Germany and, uh, and Poland. And uh, Victor uh, Verkov, one of the founders of public health, uh, went there, he's a German doctor, will acknowledge to study uh, why was there a pandemic. And he was shocked to see the life conditions of the, of the farmers, of the peasants uh, that were suffering and because of the poverty and lack of resources were dying. And he came with a very clear message that uh, these are artificial pandemic. It doesn't mean that it has created them, but the state has created all the necess necessary conditions for them to be this, uh, 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 you know, this dangerous and to have as much mortality, a uh, mortality rate as they have. And he was, uh, his uh, conclusion was that we need to get rid of the feudal system in order to truly, uh, truly cure uh, the typhoid the, uh, the epidemic. We need to redistribute land, redistribute resources, and uh, rebuild the, the, the German country as a whole from scratch so built on skilled workers. Uh, he, well, he says now is not the time. Could you have this bill in the midst of a public health and economic crisis? And without paying heed to the recent, recent windrush review, has been spectacularly misjudged and shows the Home Office remains totally out of touch. So that is one form of knowledge production that has managed to see the problem as it is. It has seen poverty and misery and crowdedness and poor life condition, but it traced the problem in the power structure of society, of how land is distributed, how money is distributed. And the solution was how can we reserve, uh, reverse the conditions that create all this misery, right? So if we jump uh, a bit more than 160 years now to what, uh, what uh, a big part of the Israeli knowledge production regarding uh, medical knowledge looks like. Uh, so it's funny to start with uh, an article that was published in 1965, uh, also staying the, the very uh, you know, familiar argument that the uh, Arabs in Israel uh, have a, a better lifestyle than most uh, Arabs in the Arab world. And, but nonetheless, they have uh, still a way to go in order to approach uh, modernity and to reach the Israeli uh, medical status. And uh, the country is very aware of that, concerned, and it is working on that. And that came in 1965. There are endless uh, examples, but one, let's see, uh, researchers who've been uh, studying uh, the situation of Bedouins in the Naqab, you know, would just come to say that uh, Bedouins live in township in the south. They are, uh, these towns, uh, townships of the Bedouins, uh, have developed preventive and curative healthcare facilities, and uh, the Bedouins are in a transitionary form of nomadic lifestyle, and uh, the large pro uh, percentage of diarrhea that they have or any other disease is related to the uh, lower uh, education of the mother or poverty or so on, and then we need to 
uh, to do programs in order to educate uh, the mothers, right? And this is uh, another, uh, you know, brilliant example of a, a, an article studying Palestinian women living in Jerusalem. And, you know, it just comes and says that in Jerusalem you have uh, Arab Palestinians and Jewish living uh, alongside each other. Jew uh, Arab Palestinian women have more uh, heart diseases and that is related to their lifestyle and maybe to the exposure of, uh, to passive smoking by their husbands. You know, so we should address these issues. And I think if we have, uh, if we look into uh, what Virkov has offered us, uh, we would uh, come up with very different conclusions. When we would talk about the Bedouins in the Nakab, we would talk that these Bedouins are a product of uh, settler colonialism, of land confiscating, of different forms of state violence that has produced these townships that they live in, and they are not in a normal transitionary state of modernity. No, they are being forced. Uh, their uh, normal habitat is being destroyed completely. Uh, and they are being forced into living in ghettos, basically. Uh, a lot of them are unrecognized with no healthcare infrastructures and so on. And that is a pro uh, one of the reasons for the uh, bad health conditions. And if we want to improve it, if we are sincere, then we need to address that. We need to address the redistribution of resources, the redistribution of land, and so on. If we want to talk about women in Jerusalem, we need to address that Jerusalem is an occupied area and very heavily militarized, right? And uh, the Palestinian population over there is a, uh, a product and a victim of different kinds of uh, state violence and brutality, so on. So how can a woman in Jerusalem uh, have a healthy lifestyle? Can she go out and exercise and do sport and, uh, and have a, a normal mental health like a woman in, in Tel Aviv does? But you know, we do not address these issues. And that is very much prevalent when we talk about all the health disparities that we can see here between the Palestinians and the Jews in Israel. So, uh, you know, and that intersects with a lot of problems of how do we interfere, uh, how do we look at race? How do we look at, uh, at race as a, as a biological construct and saying that, you know, Arabs uh, or Palestinians in Israel uh, have this and that diseases in such a uh, such rate. So it's either their biology, it's either their beliefs or their behaviors. And if it's their biology, you know, so poor them, they are a, a victim of, the, of their genes. And if it's their behaviors and beliefs, then they should, uh, you know, it's up to them. They should push a little bit uh, more, right? And that is, although it seems like a very normal and naive way of producing knowledge, it entails within it uh, various forms of, of violence and that I will, uh, I will talk about shortly. Uh, but another way of, uh, and I'll just come up with a different uh, example of how people, uh, so many of the, of the claims that the Palestinians uh, uh, are a product of have been said repetitively about the black community in the USA, about the indigenous community, in the USA, Australia, New Zealand, and so on. We are not the only settler uh, colony. But there you have different forms of uh, people trying to challenge that knowledge, right? So uh, people like Nancy Greger would say that instead of comparing groups with less versus uh, people with more resources as if it's a given fact, you know, like we like to compare smokers with non-smokers and so on, uh, this kind of uh, comparing uh, the Bedouins with the, uh, or the Palestinians with the, with the Jewish Israeli uh, uh, completely erases the distribution of the extent of how, 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 uh, how society is divided. And uh, it uh, completely hides the problematic economic, political, and social relationship uh, that has produced uh, these health inequalities. For example, if we look at New York City and uh, we, uh, we divide it by uh, what we call ICE, index of concentration at the extreme, so uh, it's combining also racial and economic data, meaning where do you have a large concentration of rich white people versus poor black people, we can say that these units correlate completely with, uh, with health outcomes. And then we can start challenging this structure, the structure uh, that the political, economical, and in our uh, case, settler colonial structure that has produced pockets 
of uh, racialized poverty if we look at all Palestinian towns inside Israel, but also if we look at Gaza as a pocket of racialized poverty that the uh, Israeli colonial uh, frontier expansion has produced, right? Gaza is not a, a given geographical unit. It did not exist before a, a, a before Israeli existence, right? It is drawn by Israeli expansion. Also, the West Bank it is not a given geographical unit. Uh, and it is uh, its borders are continuously being reshaped and redrawn, right? It's, uh, as we speak, by the Israeli annexation and so on. The refugees have been completely erased of the map, right? And they live in a, a and transferred to a, to different countries where they also live in pockets of racialized poverty. So if we look at this whole structure as the problem, the hollowing out of the middle, how we see the growing concentration of wealth, of poverty, how they are produced and how they affect health, that will lead us to a very different form of knowledge production and of medical knowledge production and uh, medical interference programs that will say in order to address this issue or that issue, we need to address what has formed them. Uh, so another example is the eco-social theory, also produced by uh, Nancy Krager, where in, instead of seeing uh, our health as a, a result of our genes, our bacteria, our behaviors, and so on, we can see indigenous population in the middle as a product of historical trauma, of ecosystem degradation, of land alienation, of inequitable medical care, of responses to this discrimination, social trauma, economical uh, deprivation, and so on, that if we would look at the Palestinians, we are uh, in, inside Israel and also in the Gaza and the West Bank and the refugees, we are a product of these huge processes of ecosystem degradation, of land alienation, of inadequate medical care, of uh, responses to, uh, uh, to discrimination and endless resources that have shaped our health and has created what we call the pre-existing conditions that make us more susceptible to diseases, right? Uh, and also in that, we need to look at, uh, you know, several uh, uh, scholars have uh, discussed how bodies do not just tell stories, they tell histories, how we can study the historical trauma and the transgenerational uh, a transmission of that historical trauma. Similar cases have been done with the, you know, Toni Morrison, with the experience of slavery and how that has been transmitted throughout a generation. So we can talk about the foundational violence, which really means the, uh, the erasure of uh, uh, the, uh, the erasure of, of history, the erasure of what, what was a pre-existing reality, how did it look like, how was the social relationship between uh, the indigenous uh, communities and their land, how they practiced their life, where were they were, and so on. Uh, and here erasure, his, uh, erasure of history takes a crucial part in, uh, in uh, deleting all these uh, processes and uh, really in, uh, it is a tool used by the architects of structural violence uh, and it completely destroys complete, uh, entire parts of histories. Uh, and although it looks very subtle and very naive, right, if we, we can easily come and do a snapshot of reality and see, yes, the Palestinians uh, live in such and such towns, and then they have this and that diseases, and they, you know, they, they smoke more, or they, they don't uh, exercise, and thus uh, they should, uh, you know, they should uh, invest in themselves and do that because of erasure of history, but if we truly want to engage in history, we need to see that the, Palest the Palestinian habitat, as we do today, is a product of, a, of the Nakba of settler. I will stop my uh, sharing the screen. Yeah, can you see me now? Yeah, so we can uh, truly, uh, if we want to engage in history, we can see that the settler colonial process, uh, through its foundational violence, which has resulted in the refugees problem, in the expulsion of the vast majority of the Palestinians uh, from their homelands, and the people who remained, whether it, was, it is inside Israel or the West Bank and Gaza, do live in an ever-shrinking uh, spaces and, and more ghettoized and more uh, impoverished uh, that are exposed to more and more uh, police brutality and so on. 
And if we truly care about their health and we want to engage within it, we need to open that up for a, future, uh, for, uh, a discussion. And of course, if we want to talk about Ghazi, which 80% of the population are refugees, we can, uh, we can simply ignore the history and say, yes, that Ghazi is uh, uh, the, uh, you know, the area of Ghazi is such and such, and uh, people live in there, and they have uh, this and that uh, health issues, and we need to address that through further investment in infrastructures or donation and so on. Or we can say that Ghazi has been produced as a geographical unit, as uh, how, uh, you know, uh, people call it a dumping ground for refugees, right? Uh, and in order to, uh, to truly uh, engage with Ghazi, we need to talk about the siege, about lifting the siege, about the right of return, uh, and in that sense, the redistribution of land to reach uh, a better and more sustainable uh, outcomes. And I think here is the time to salute Zuhrot for their ongoing uh, work to bring back these narratives of Nakba as a foundational, uh, uh, foundational uh, issue in, uh, in Palestinian history, a foundational event. And although, yes, we talk about settler colonialism as a structure, not an event, so the, the uh, uh, the rebuilding of sovereignty, right, of Israeli sovereignty, of Jewish sovereignty over this land is not an event. It was not, it did not end in the Nakba. It's an ongoing event, even as we speak now uh, with the annexation. Just two years ago, a medical university, uh, a medical faculty was opened in Ariel, right, in a settlement, also a part of the normalization of the ever-growing uh, settler uh, claiming sovereignty and claiming space and so on. So that is an ongoing process, uh, and in these processes, usually the, uh, the area acquired first becomes the quiet land. So uh, you know, people start talking about 67, uh, the occupation uh, in 60s, uh, after 67, and the violence of the of Israeli state as a frontier violence. As a, you know, Israel is a normal state that is misbehaving uh, in the West Bank or Gaza, rather than addressing the foundational violence that has resulted in the erasures of, uh, of refugees from the map, the erasures of, uh, of Palestinian as a viable political uh, you know, subject uh, in life and in medicine, and how we can uh, address these and how we can imagine and envision a future where uh, uh, that has at least, if not ultimate justice, historical justice within it or relative justice. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Osama, for this fascinating talk. Um, and yeah, it's really mind blowing to, to think uh, about all the different ways in which colonialism works and keeps blaming the oppressed uh, even for their sickness. Uh, even now in these days, in one of his uh, press briefings, uh, our prime minister hinted uh, of uh, Arab or Palestinian peoples as needing to be taught uh, hygiene. And this is just uh, one example. So thank you. Um, next up, we have uh, Dr. Bram uh, Wispaway. He is an associate physician in the Division of Global Health Equity at Brighton and Women Hospital, and an instructor in medicine at Harvard Medical School. He is a co-founder and chief strategist of Health for Palestine, a community organizing initiative in Palestinian refugee camps that seeks to maximize wellness and address health barriers via social accompaniment and creative integration with existing facilities. Bram is currently project lead in Ohio for Partners in Health Community, tracing collaborative to protect vulnerable population from COVID-19, as well as an Atlantic Fellow for Health e Equity. Uh, Bram will be speaking on the topic of um, why Palestinian health is intricately linked to their liberation. Please, Bram, thank you for being with us. Great, thank you so much, Rafael. Thank you, Osama, as well. I'm gonna to touch on a few similar points. I'm gonna discuss a little bit about 
uh, the situation in uh, refugee camps right now in Palestine and, and what that looks like in the era of COVID and kind of what are the underlying um, health issues that kind of led to the um, potentially disastrous situation during this pandemic. Um, as well as you know, this whole question of of yeah, how do how do we even think about health in a context like this? And I think Osama really teased out those those core issues really really well. Um, and then talk because I you know I'm an American doctor to really talk about solidarity and you know what does allyship really look like and how do we think about allyship? And I think a lot of actually the things that I believe deeply and that I would offer up are really kind of built into the mission of Zofrot. You know, as you as you mentioned earlier. Um, uh, Rachel. And so I think um, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. And I'll, I'll even just start off now actually with a, a quick story. I was um, at a conference once with uh, former Black Panther, Ruba bin Wahad. And he, you know, this whole, you know, question of allyship came up in the Q&A, you know, and Druba had spent two decades in prison uh, as a political prisoner in the United States. Um, he successfully sued the FBI um, these, uh, regarding the COINTELPRO uh, um, program that they had and had them release a number of papers that ultimately showed how the FBI was intentionally targeting and, and sometimes assassinating um, uh, black leaders, revolutionary black leaders in the United States. And he, we were talking about allyship and he's like, listen, we don't need allies. We don't need supporters. We need co-conspirators. I want you to think about that as like, how do we, how do we think about our role uh, in this work as non-Palestinians vis-a-vis um, return and reparations. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen here as well, just to give a little bit of background about uh, refugee camps, in particular where we do work. Um, so hopefully you guys can see this here. Um, so this is, uh, this is Ida refugee camp uh, in Bethlehem. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the really the health situation. You can see here, just for starters, in Ida, what you have are you know what originally were you know going back to 1950 tents. You now have concrete uh, structures that are stacked higher and higher to the point of um, structural instability and extreme population density. And I'll I'll show you just in a in a quick visualization uh, soon really what kind of density you're talking about. And I think try to thinking about physical distancing or social distancing as it's called uh, during this current pandemic. Out in the hillsides there, you can see um, uh, settlements. And if you're, you know, have really close eyes, you can see even the, the wall there. There's a picture I took a couple years ago. Um, but in, in the West Bank refugee camps, what you have is significant fragmentation of health. On top of all the stuff Osama talked about, you have a situation where you have the UN, responsible for care for refugees, but not really delivering a full you know, package of health services. You have the Palestinian Authority's Ministry of Health. You have myriad private and NGO options. You know, for certain types of conditions or procedures, you need to leave the West Bank um, or Gaza and either go Jordan, Israel, Egypt. So you have total fragmentation. You have no continuity of care, which is a disaster for any diseases that can't be simply cured uh, or taken care of in a short amount of time, for example, like an infection that can be cured with antibiotics. So really what you have now is a huge burgeoning of chronic diseases that are deeply linked to going back all the way to the Nakba, to ethnic cleansing and everything that's happened uh, in the meantime. So I'm gonna go ahead, first just to show you here the, the population density that I, uh, that I mentioned. For those of you who are from the United States, you see Manhattan, uh, there on the far left, and then some of the more, most populous cities in the world. And then look at Ida camps. You're really talking about triple the population density, and that's pretty representative of you know, the 19 uh, camps in the West Bank. Osama touched on this as, as well, and really thinking about what are the, the structural determinants, the political determinants, the historical determinants of health. And so you think about a chronic disease like diabetes, where um, among West Bank refugees, you're really talking about one of the highest rates uh, in the world at now probably well over 20%. Um, uh, among Jewish Israelis, less than 10%. And you can hear, see here on the left, also in, in American terms, uh, the difference between the rates in white Americans versus black Americans and indigenous Americans. And really, you know, diabetes is, is really one of those diseases that is an example of how oppression really sits on the body in, in today's terms. I'm just read a quote from 
a PBS documentary that came out a few years ago called, called um, uh, Unnatural Causes. And the narrator was talking to a Berkeley epidemiologist about this uh, phenomena he was noticing. He's like, Pacific Islanders, African Americans, Aboriginal peoples in Australia, American Indians, Palestinians, they're all suffering from type two diabetes at double or triple the rates of national averages. Um, and the epidemiologist Leonard Symes said this, they have totally different histories. They're all different populations and yet they all have the same disease manifestation. What's going on? What's the common denominator? And in every case, we're talking about people who have been dispossessed of their land and of their history. They haven't been able to recreate it. In all of these far-flung parts of the world, the social circumstance of being ripped from roots ends up with the same manifestation of disease. So our project um, in, uh, started in Ida Naza camps, we recently expanded into Balata camp in Nablus, is, is really a social accompaniment program. It's community-led, all, everyone who's taking part in the project are from uh, these refugee camps, mostly young people, to address chronic diseases like diabetes, hypertension, that ultimately, though, have root causes uh, that go much deeper. I'll talk about that a little bit longer. To get a hint of that, you can see here, this slide's a little bit out of date, it's about five years old, but what's interesting is you can see the rates of diabetes by age, and the red is Palestine compared to Middle East and North Africa, as well as world averages, and what you see that's interesting in this graph that I want to highlight highlight is that in older Palestinians, and this again was, this was taken from data that's over a decade old, were suffering from diabetes at much lower rates than the Middle East North Africa average as well as the world average. But if you go to the middle aged, it's higher. And that's even more uh, pronounced now. And that's actually that older population, that was the population that was born pre-Nakba. And so you can start to see even that this is not a population as, as Osama was I'm mentioning it's not a question of you know cultural tr traditional diet or you know exercise habits you know this was there was very specific historical and uh political happenings that led to this um huge uh outbreak so i just wanted to mention some of those those things and you know it's very relevant when we talk about um COVID 19 and i'm uh, sure because there's, there's a few things that make people particularly susceptible to COVID-19. I've been working on the front lines here in Boston, both clinically, and now I'm working with partners in health to figure out strategies with testing, isolation, quarantine, contact tracing, how to protect vulnerable communities in the United States. And what we know in the U.S. is that in cities where, say, Black Americans make up 20, 30 percent of the population, they've been up to 70, 80 percent of cases and deaths from COVID-19. And the, the situation, a lot of the context, as, as Osama was pointing out, that leads to this huge disparity in how an infectious disease that, in theory, should be equally spreadable to all people, very differentially uh, impacts populations based on histories of historical oppression, structural violence. Um, so, so overcrowded conditions, talked about that already. Obviously, that makes it easier to spread a virus like uh, SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19, poverty, um, an inability to physical physical distance. I mean, if you look at the you know the photo of Ida Camp, you can see it's just an, it's an impossibility. Um, question of essential workers, right? So many Palestinians, half of Palestinians, continue because Israel did not halt construction during COVID nineteen crisis, right? Construction was considered an essential process that must continue, and so you have actually you had very few cases in the West Bank, still to this day only 550 cases approximately in West Bank, East Jerusalem, and Gaza combined. But 75% of those cases came from workers who were working inside Israel and then coming back to their families, right? So you think about what are all the different economic forces um, and everything that's actually making people susceptible, what, you know, uh, these sort of pathologies of power as, as Paul Farmer um, calls them and as uh, Yara linked here in our chat. Um, and then question of chronic diseases. So in China, patients, people with diabetes died at three, uh, three times more likely to die than patients without diabetes. In the UK, 26% of deaths have been in people with living with diabetes. Only 6% of the population in the UK has diabetes. So you're talking about these chronic diseases, which as we talked about are related 
through histories of oppression, loss of land, loss of ability to have sovereignty over your, your own food choices, your own um, economic situation. Uh, and then that massively increases your risk of a disease like COVID-19. And so you start to see all the ways that uh, health inequities and illness is compounded by these social and political and structural problems. And, and refugees you know, in the West Bank, Gaza, and Lebanon, Palestinian refugees kind of throughout um, this area are at very, very high risk for all of these reasons, right? Overcrowdedness, poverty, uh, the essential worker situation, uh, working inside Israel, and then uh, chronic diseases. Um, so I want to talk a little bit, you know, though, about something that's a little bit more on the hopeful side, a, a bit more uh, exciting in terms of what are some of the opportunities, like um, Rachel was talking about at the beginning, what, what are the opportunities that a, a pandemic like COVID-19 actually pre presents? And, um, you know, what we've been seeing in, in camps like Ida and Alaza camps where we're working um, is a really a return to a style of activism um, that's very reminiscent of the first intifada from the late 80s, early 90s. Um, and you see refugees, you see popular committees in the camps are delivering food, other essential items. Um, people are donating portions of their salary together for a common fund to tackle the disease. Uh, there have been debt forgiveness from you know, stores. Uh, people are growing crops now on rooftops uh, where they can find them. Uh, organization that, you know, the community organization that we work with, the Community Health Worker Project, LAGI, um, has been doing an amazing uh, rooftop garden project. Um, and then the community health workers themselves, really, you know, our project, it's, it's a health project, but essentially even more than that, it's really community organizing. We have the biomedical component uh, where the, these young refugees, the community health workers work on uh, diabetes, hypertension, all the, the big drivers of, of morbidity and mortality in West Bank camps. Um, uh, but, you know, you also have a mental health component that we're doing. We're talking about a population that's in Ida camp is the most tear gassed population in the world, according to a University of California study. Um, and you're talking about uh, community organizing. And so we, we have, um, you know, a educational series, a lot of first and foremost activists and talking with community health workers. Um, so these, this is the project we're building and they're calling their, their patients every day on the phone, even when they can't visit them because of, of the lockdown, um, providing educational materials, doing emergency visits uh, when needed to help actually people avoid when their blood sugar gets really high, giving them insulin so that they don't have to go to the hospital, these kind of things. So you're seeing a lot of community engagement, a lot of community activism in response to the lockdown that, that started in Bethlehem in, in March due to, I should mention, uh, the bringing of a new illness to the indigenous Palestinian community from Europeans, right? Which is very reminiscent of the history of the country I come from, United States, where you basically had mass genocide against the indigenous population, bringing diseases like smallpox and then obviously through warfare and, and stolen land from the white European settler population uh, that created this settler colonial nation that we now call the United States. So um, it's just interesting to see that kind of this reverberation through history and then the Palestinians have done an amazing job at, at, at controlling COVID so far, but COVID is going to be around for a while and you're really talking about very, very high risk to still have this spread through the camps. Um, so that's just a little bit about the, the situation right now and what's going on in camps. I was last there, you know, in early February, um, haven't been able to, to to go now, but um, keeping very close uh, contact with everyone through Zoom. So I just want to talk real quick, since you know this is this is huge as as a, a citizen in the United States, and um, want to just really talk about what solidarity means uh, when you're thinking about the root causes of of these diseases, both the things like diabetes, the underlying chronic diseases, and COVID nineteen. You have to. What I think the answer is, you know, because I think there's always so much temptation, you know, international NGO work, you know, we have these humanitarian impulses. And, you know, the way I think about it, and I, and, and I have to be very careful in my own work, is that when you think about doing health work in a context, as a foreigner, in a context like occupied Palestinian territory, you have to think about this question of 
who's responsible for these health problems and what does it mean if you have a bunch of foreign money pouring in to help mitigate some of these health problems does that potentially extend uh, the situation, the context, and the occupation. And so it's really, really important that actually we try to put pressure through advocacy, through whatever means possible, on these root causes, which essentially is the failure of third states, particularly the United States and all other countries, but to hold Israel, Israel accountable for all of its illegal activity, war crimes, crimes against humanity that have been well documented, uh, illegal settlements, uh, illegal occupation, um, all of this uh, uh, activity. Um, so so that, that to me is like, that's where it starts. It's like, there's a lot of temptation always, and even as someone, I say, who does work in Palestine, but the, the real, work and the work that I think Palestinians are always asking of me and, and of us as allies, right, or as co-conspirators, uh, to use Daruba's term, um, is to uh, talk, to convince our fellow citizens and our governments to hold Israel accountable. And only then, you know, only then with this whole question then of return, right, which is the primary point of identity for Palestinians that I work with. That's the, the focal point is the question of return, of reparations. Only starting there with that root issue will then allow for the possibility to create health systems that are not fragmented, uh, to have economic control over their life, uh, to, to be able to engage in healthy behaviors uh, that will reverse some of these causes. Otherwise, we're just doing this mitigation work, which is important to ease suffering, but it can't be without a really, really, really heavy push on, on those root causes, right? So I think um, I'll go ahead and stop there so we leave, we leave time for questions, but I, I just wanted to make that really clear. And, you know, and along with that, supporting community-led initiatives like this kind of community health work that's happening in Aydan Laza, that's the other piece. I think that's the most important, is supporting the community to have power over their own situation and to um, really start to change uh, the situation for themselves. Thanks. Thank you, Bram. That was really enlightening. Um, I love this idea of being a co-conspirator. Um, and I'm, I'm just reminded that uh, well, you were talking about uh, construction work um, continuing in Israel uh, throughout the, the lockdown. Uh, but interestingly, I would say, uh, demolitions work were, uh, also continued uh, all through when we were all in lockdown. Uh, bulldozers would still be on the ground uh, demolishing Palestinian houses in the West Bank and within Israel, within the 48th border that was designated. Uh, they were designated as essential workers that can't be stopped under any, any circumstances, and it really tells you a lot. Um, please, if you have questions, I remind you, uh, put them in the chat box, and we will have time for questions uh, in a little bit. And I want to now invite my dear friend, Moran Barir, Moran is an activist, thinker, video creator, and educator living in occupied Jaffa. Uh, she's a longtime member of the Hot and a partner in Vision, a member of the Return Council, participant and facilitator in groups to reimagine and plan Palestinian return. She will speak about the Hot's return vision and how COVID-19 gives it renewed relevance. Please, Moran, yes, so good thank to have you with us. Thank you. I'm so glad to be here and I'm very excited. Um, um, okay. Hey, do you hear me well? Rachel? Can we you? hear you great. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So I will uh, maybe connect to this last uh, point that uh, Bram uh, was speaking about. Uh, hold Israel uh, accountable and to promote this idea. Uh, and how we can do it uh, for, as an Israeli Jewish uh, citizen. Uh, and so I will quickly um, present 
the the paper that we was we we were working on uh, the paper on of the committee of the return uh, and then i will speak about the relevance uh, now uh, during and in light of the coronavirus uh, a crisis, lockdown, and all the situation. Um, so, uh, yes, I am. So, I am a long-time member of Zohot, as Rachel said, and I'm a long-time member of uh, imagining and thinking and um, planning the return of the Palestinian refugees to this land uh, as an, a Jewish, as a Jewish Israeli with other Israelis and also other Palestinians, uh, <clears throat> uh, imagining it together, planning it together, and practically writing down uh, tools and ideas uh, in, the, in the sense that we want to make a toolkit for the time that the return will happen. So we have things ready that we already planned. So at least, of course, to plan it, um, we're not presuming like that we have the mandate to plan, but uh, in a sense we have the mandate because we believe and we uh, dream on a shared society in which the Palestinians, of course, will return. This is the basic. This is the basic premise that the Palestinian refugees that were deported, of course, they should return and rebuild their. Um, houses and villages and neighborhoods uh, and also uh, live together here uh, everyone that live here um, uh, so um, uh, so the committee of the return is a committee of Jewish Israelis uh, uh, imagining and planning the return and our target audience is is the Israeli Jewish uh, audience uh, we have have been planning, or uh, let's say um, uh, thinking and planning, yes, and imagining the return in 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 groups for years, and then we realize that we need to do it for a second only the Jewish Israelis be, because um, uh, we are going to stay here when the return happens, inshallah that it happens soon. And we, we have to uh, refer to our society also and to speak the, uh, to our society, to Jewish Israelis. So this is uh, why we have um, this committee, which is made of Jewish Israelis and uh, our audience is Jewish Israelis. Um, and um, I will quickly speak about this uh, paper, and also I want, we have been writing several papers in several groups of planning the return. We have the Cape Town paper, and we have the Jaffa uh, paper, uh, looking on the space of Jaffa, uh, Jaffa, and imagining and planning how the return will occur, occur here. Um, uh, and we only realize when we plan those things and we think about those things together about the return, about realizing it, and like actually looking into the details of what it means, who will return, where did, will they return, what we're, what we're going to build, who decides what and where we're going to build and how will the society look like. So uh, we only realize that we have so many um, things to regard to to refer to and uh, it's not like one group in one year can plan everything no this is not what we are saying we are saying let's start we should start go into details this is our mandate and this is our um, 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 belief that this is what we should do uh, a lot of time inside Israel for the Jewish Israeli public discourse we, we the speaking about the return of refugees in Israel is a big, big taboo. People either don't know what we are talking about, have no idea, return, they have no preconcept of what could it be, or they're really aggressive about it and uh, negating and pushing it aside. Uh, yes, and we are uh, 
And, all, and if there is at all a discourse about it, the discourse would be something like, are we in favor pro or, or cons of the return? Are we in favor of the right of return or not? And we're saying, this is not the discourse. Of course, we are for the right of return. I mean, this is the wrong that we have done as Israelis, maybe not personally, maybe yes, some personally actually did it. But we are saying we are responsible for it. And we should, the, 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 the reparation, the healing uh, and, and repairing the wrong that we have done is in our, our hands also, not only in our hands, but definitely we have a, an important role to do. Um, so this is the idea behind and in this paper or in those papers that we write uh, and, uh, and publish uh, uh, for people to uh, start thinking about it with us and have it in mind with us and follow us and join us and plan on their own, of course. Uh, so we are talking about the things we should do uh, towards the return and how we perceive the life and the society and the land after the return or with the return. Uh, how the society will look like, how the economy will look like, land reform, um, educational system, many, many um, things. We, it's not that we are saying we have one way and we should go this way, uh, one state or two states or a bilingual educational system or shared communities or separate. It's not that we um, want to decide exactly how the society would look like, but no, but we try to start and make new language and new discourse in which we sit together and think together and think about everyone's needs if we think about a shared society, a shared and inclusive society. So of course it's not hierarchical. Of course we have to share the power if it's shared society, the political power, the economical power and everything. So we are starting to practice what it means to share uh, our needs and how would it look like. So all of our papers that we publish are more like a suggestion, a suggestion to how to begin, how to approach this subject to, and as a starting point, let's say. Um, uh, so this is in general about the paper. Um, and I would like to say a few words about the Corona times, um, sorry, about the Corona times, uh, uh, and how I think personally it affects and amplifies um, our role as Jewish Israelis in promoting the return. Not only a promote, promo, I'm not talking about promoting the right of return, as a lot of time it is used in Israel, in, uh, as in the mainstream Israeli discourse, let's say, but promoting the return. Actually, um, promoting it to happen. Um, okay, so uh, the Corona virus times with the lockdown and the crisis, uh, we've heard a lot from my colleagues, very interesting uh, point of views, which I share um, and very knowledgeable. Uh, and I'm not an academic and I'm not a doctor, uh, but I um, um, uh, but I can see that uh, the crisis is very widely and it is caused by political reasons and it is shaped, like uh, Osama said, it is shaped uh, by uh, political um, motives. Um, and, and I think uh, for me, the lockdown, the fact, uh, uh, Okay, let's, sorry, I want to say two things about the fragility and, and, the, and the choice that we have inside it. I think it is very clear in, we have a pandemic. It is new to most of us, I'm not sure, but uh, it never happened in this scale. Uh, and, and I think it's a, 
it ex um, exposes how fragile we are as community, as communities. As it doesn't matter how knowledgeable we are and how much technology we have and, and how developed we are or progressed we are. It doesn't matter. We are uh, exposed to different kind of threats, uh, of threats, and I think this fragility, this vulnerability that we are feeling, is very important because it's not a flaw. It's not a bad thing that we should walk, start a war against. No, I think we should embrace it, and we should choose uh, differently and it really calls us to choose differently a lot of time in the israeli discourse we have this no choice discourse we had no choice but to go into a war we have no choice to do many things as a society and as private people but but now i think that this time um calls us uh, to choose we can choose to continue with occupying and colonizing and using force to oppress people and to maintain our wealth or privileges or many other stuff. But I think it is an opportunity. When I speak with Israelis today, with Jewish Israelis, I see the opportunity to show them that we, we, are, a, we are being called to, to rethink about stuff all the world like okay not all the world but a lot of the world many 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 countries all around the world were locked down so a lot of them are still locked down and it's like everyone was sent to their houses to think this is how i uh, imagine it and in this time uh, when everybody is at home thinking of course i'm not underestimating the scale of the huge um, catastrophe that is still going on because of it economically and health wise but uh, but from my point of view um, i see um, an opportunity to recalculate our choices and, and an opportunity to choose differently and uh, and this fragility that was exposed again um, um, is calling us is showing us how we are all connected, I think, mentally, but also, like uh, Bram said, um, we are, th the borders are imaginary. We spread diseases and it's an actual thing, but it's also a thing that is, uh, um, we can use to uh, choose to go to another, um, a, I don't know, they mention of living in the sense of to decide to work together on stuff, to decide uh, to be different, to decide. I mean, people have been colonizing and occupying lands for so long, and I think uh, it could maybe it could work for us for many more centuries. But I think uh, we are called to choose differently. Um, and maybe uh, for to sum it up, um, uh, I think my personal motive in um, in promoting the return and in um, writing papers and speaking with Israelis about the return, which is it's not an obvious choice. It's very weird choice and it's very difficult choice because people in Israel. They don't, they react very harshly on this. Um, but for me, and even more now uh, uh, in light of the coronavirus, I think it's taking, uh, to choose to do this, even though my society is pushing it aside, negating it and negating me sometimes and pushing me aside and being aggressive towards the concept, towards me. But I say, this is the way to, for me to take my power back. Uh, I do not um, agree. I do not approve of uh, 
my government and their choices. And maybe um, I cannot change it at the moment. I cannot turn the table upside down like in a second. But, um, but maybe, um, but I definitely, it, it shouldn't uh, let me down. It shouldn't hold me from doing what I think is right and, and what I know is right. And this is taking my power back because if they're trying to have us is Jewish Israelis like a crowd that is obedient and we, most of the people say, okay, what can we do? I cannot change the law. I cannot change society. But I say, no, it's not true. Of course we can and we should. And, and, and um, saying that what can I do? I cannot do anything. And then, and therefore not doing anything. This is exactly what uh, the people uh, with power that want to maintain their power uh, and the land and the money uh, want us to, uh, this is the state of mind they want us to be in. And I say, no, I, with uh, planning the return and talking about the return, even though it's the weirdest thing as a Jewish Israeli within my society, because my target audience is the Jewish Israelis. I live here, I love it here, and I want to stay here, and I will fight uh, for the healing of the place for as long as I live. And this is my way to speak to my people, to part of my people, because part of my people are in the diaspora, and I wish they return, uh, and I wish to live, to see the return. Uh, but I know that part of the people that are here, the Jewish Israeli that are here, they, I wish them also will stay. And I want for us, for all of us, Palestinian Israelis and even every, uh, all the humans, okay, and all the creatures, not only human, I, I want us to find new ways to live together. Uh, and, uh, and, and just to, to, I will wrap up um, with, an, um, with a thought that came up to my mind. I saw the, the, the film about Ruth Bader Ginsburg, uh, the narrative films, not the documentary. I mean, I saw both, but in, in the narrative, there is this small, she, she wants to change the law. She's a, a, an American uh, woman, female uh, lawyer, a groundbreaking lawyer, uh, and she wants to change the law uh, that discriminates women because of the gender. And she has this mentor, a woman lawyer who is older than, than her and more experienced than her. And she, she's kind of her mentor. And she tells her, you cannot change the law when the crowd, when the people is not, they're not ready. Like she's tell her, forget about it. Um, and then for a while she forgets about it. But then she, uh, Ruth has this interaction with her daughter, with her teenage daughter, and, and so, something happens and then she realizes, okay, the people are ready. She see her daughter and she see how she's ready to change the law, to stop the discrimination between the genders or between the sexes or both. And she has this moment. And for me, this is it. I am working here and preparing my people and the hearts of my people for the moment that it will be enabled for it to happen. So this is my mandate personally and as the group of the Committee of the Return. And um, yes, and that's it. Thank you so much, Moran, for these words. Uh, and well, I see we have a lot of, of questions here uh, and we'll get to some of them uh, in just a few minutes. Um, and I also invite you again to uh, check our uh, website and see our work of uh, almost 20 years uh, of acknowledging the Nakba, commemorating, uh, mapping destroyed Palestinian localities, taking testimonies from Nakba survivors uh, and imagining and planning the return. Uh, we have a lot of materials there and you are very welcome. You 
you can also download our app. It's called the iNakba and it is available on the Apple Store or Google Play. And you can install it uh, right on your mobile phones uh, and access um, the map of Palestine with the destroyed villages um, and all the information about them, including images and videos. Um, next up, we are very fortunate to be joined by a um, uh, Palestinian American poet, Remy Kenazi. He's a poet, writer, and organizer uh, based in New York City. He's the author of the new released collection on poetry, Before the Next Bomb Drops, Rising Up from Brooklyn to Palestine. Uh, he's also the author of Poetic Injustice, Writing on Resistance in Palestine, and the editor of Poets for Palestine. His political commentary has been featured by news outlets uh, throughout the world. He has appeared in the Fal Palestinian Festival of Literature, as well as Poetry International. He's a Lanan Residency Fellow and is on the advisory committee of the Palestinian Campaign for the Academic and Cultural Boycott of Israel. He has taught poetry workshops from Oklahoma to the West Bank, given talks from New York City to London, and has performed at hundreds of venues from New Orleans to Amman. Rami, thank you so much for joining us tonight, please. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I, my poem will be shorter than, than that intro. I appreciate that. Um, so, um, so I live in New York, uh, New York. Uh, I lived in the city for, I think about 17 years and, and being at the epicenter of coronavirus uh, in terms of, of death toll and people impacted, I've been thinking a lot about disposability lately. I'm gonna do a poem, but this is to kind of preface it. Um, and kind of thinking within the context of global disposability, Palestinians, uh, refugees, uh, black and brown communities in the United States, indigenous folks, um, apparently anybody over the age of 60 uh, in the US, and you know, how these systems and structures of oppression, you know, be it capitalism, be it settler colonialism, be it a corporation profiting off of a lot of people suffering, are very much interconnected. And the idea of the Nakaba being ongoing and uh, something that's not stopping in the present, but is connected to return in the future. Um, and so, I'm going to do a piece about uh, the Nakba, but I, I very much appreciate everything uh, all the speakers said, and and not just the kind of education of the Nakba, but 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 actually what actions are we taking, or not just challenging apartheid or occupation or um, you know systems of deprivation in the U.S., police brutality, mass incarceration, but the question of like what are you going to do about it? Um, so this piece is called Nakba, uh, and uh, my parents and grandparents are refugees from 1948. Um, my grandmother was pregnant with my mom and they were kicked out of Palestine uh, and everything until her dying day was Yaffa, Yaffa, Yaffa. Um, it was always about return. And so, um, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to be sharing the space. I hope you enjoy the poem. It's an old one, so I'm going to read it off a book. No. I normally stand. I'm a performer. So uh, if I, uh, you know, shout into your microphone, that's what happens. She was scared. Seven months pregnant, guns pointed at temples, tears dropping, stomach cusp, back bent, dirt pathways leading to dispossession, rocking boats, waves crashing, people falling, rushing over each other, packing into small spaces, like memories. Her home, mandated, occupied, cleansed, conquered, terrorizer sat on hills sniping children, neighbors fled on April 10th, when word came of massacre. They stayed, didn't fight, didn't flee, shells and bombs bursting in air like anthems, prayed for the dead with priests and imams, prayed for the living, looking over shoulders for the Ergun and Haganah. She's a warrior, raised life, planted trees, painted fruit, cared for the road as if it was her garden. Orphaned twice, at birth, from Palestine, whispered Yaffa till final breath, never knew essence until she found emptiness, 48 ways to flee. And she found Beirut, bullet holes in buildings, a reminder of home, but not home. Years later, daughter sat on hills in the south, dreaming of breaking water, never touched thinks of their mother, 
that warrior, how battles still rage here and abroad, orchards flourished, propagandists called them barons, land expropriated for Europeans thirsting for territory. Colonist, not native, not from here, plant flags, call it home, rename cities and villages, wiping clean and clearing memory that this is not theirs. August 22nd, 2009, her frail hand shook, lip trembled, didn't want to die, but suffered decades. She will speak Arabic, broken English, wounded words and murmurs, her eyes closed, but every so often they blink brilliance. Memories that cannot be erased, uprooted or stolen, she has not forgotten. We have not forgotten. We will not forget. Veins like roots of olive trees, we will return. That is not a threat, not a wish, a hope, or a dream, but a promise. Thank you. I'm going to mute now. <laughs> That's a tough act to follow. Uh... Thank you so much, Remy. Um, I'm actually sitting in Yaffa right now. This is where I live. Uh, I see my neighbor's Ramadan lights from my windows. And there is not a day that I walk the streets here and I don't think uh, about Yaffa's refugees and when would they return and, and what more we need to do for that to happen and we definitely need to do much, much more. Uh, and I hope you all join us in the efforts. Um, sorry, I'm a bit emotional. Um, we have some questions from all of you. Uh, Bettina asks, uh, that's a question for uh, Osama and Bran. Uh, are there any readable and accessible publications about the health of the Palestinian population in the occupied territory uh, in the socio-economic and historical context. Hi, yes, uh, so yes, indeed, we are very lucky and fortunate to have the Birzeit Institute of Public Health uh, and Research who have been pioneering uh, and working in the impossible conditions also during the Antifada and the blockade and truly redefining uh, public health uh, from the Palestinian perspective and uh, bring, talking uh, not only about diseases but the wounds from the inside and how does the uh, humiliation feels and how is that translated into health uh, and the uh, and anxieties and depressions but also about hardcore medical stuff so i've sent uh, one of the articles but basically everything written by rita jokaman who is the head of the department uh, is brilliant you can google it in uh, google scholar or pubmed and uh, she has written excessively about the, the subject thank you um we have a question from Joel, several ones. Um, the first one is uh, for Bram, I think. Uh, what's the casual connection between history erasure and prevalence of diabetes? Bram? Bram? Okay, sorry, I, I couldn't unmute myself. Um, the causal connection. Yeah, the, you know, I think it's, it's really a whole series of, of events going way back. I mean, I think you could, I could, you know, almost even more appropriately speak about the situation um, in the United States. Uh, you know, I think it ultimately has to do with um, the uh, people have over their own uh, due to historical processes that, you know possession um, 
uh, a press that has historical basis then continues all the way up into the present day. So, you know, you can draw the line for Black Americans, for example, right through from chattel slavery being kidnapped uh, from their homes in West Africa uh, and brought and then basically powering the economic engine of what's become the richest country in the history of the world. Uh, and, and then the treatment all through, you know, um, you know, 400, you know, or 200 years, 250 years of slavery, 150 years of Jim Crow and sort of legalized second class citizenry. And then the last 50 years of, of ongoing structural racism and uh, manifesting through, you know, political and economic uh, considerations, um, all of those things deeply, deeply impacting um, generation over generation to the present day, the health. And we see that in all sorts of different ways now. Um, we're learning more and more about the ways that racism is it impacts people's uh, health, even through uh, seeing changes on MRI scans of the brain of, of vascular changes um, based on how much uh, oppression and racism you face. So there, we're learning more about the real biomedical details, but you know, all of it, it takes a long uh, historical course. That's why in some cases reading, you know, and that's why Rita Jockerman is so good and I agree with Osama's answer, um, but really reading about the historical and the political will ultimately inform you very accurately about who's gonna be the longest lived population, the population with higher infant mortality ratios, all those things all stack up. If you, if you tell the story of uh, indigenous uh, ethnic cleansing and genocide, whether it's in Australia or whether it's in the United States, or whether it's in Palestine, you're gonna see the exact same health outcomes in each of those cases. Thank you. Yeah, um, may I ask um, on the Palestinian context? Sure, please. So if we want to look at, so diabetes also here is much more among Palestinians and also the mortality from the diabetes. People should not die from diabetes that easily. We have good medications. But if we look at the entire chain of events, also from a land alienation, ecosystem degradation, how people like woke up one day and became a minority or refugees and became a landless peasant. They just became farmers without any land. So uh, everything has changed in their livelihood. Also, of how they deal with land, their food consumption, what they eat or do not eat, what they work, you know, they become construction workers or, uh, uh, you know, unemployed, but also their spaces have shrinked. So they do not have uh, now safe spaces to, to walk and to walk at night and exercise and do sports and no, no parks or green parks or so on. Uh, and also, you know, uh, poverty is uh, very much related to that because who can afford, you know, we can see who will uh, buy uh, chocolates and ice cream and who will buy quinoa and broccoli and so on. So naturally, the more affluent societies uh, are more targeted in terms of healthy food and healthy lifestyle and, and so on and green spaces versus, so we can see that very clearly in the Palestinian as uh, in any indigenous uh, or marginalized community. Thank you, Osama. We, and we have a comment here that is uh, related to, to what you just said uh, from Harold in the UK, that in the UK we have millions of people living in overcrowded conditions uh, and the virus is very unequal here as it is in Palestine. We are not all in it together uh, and of course uh, in the Palestinian context that is related uh, to what Osama says, uh, people who have been robbed of their land um, and, and of their property, um, cannot keep their health in general, cannot keep social distancing uh, right now, and that's a um, very huge effect or direct effect of colonialism uh, on people's health. Um, yeah, Joel had... So crowdedness is very tricky term because also as uh, Bram has mentioned, Manhattan is very crowded, right? So you can be a uh, rich crowded and we can look at Tel Aviv or Farsaba. Uh, so places that you are rich crowded, you have your own uh, small apartment with the good water system, hygiene, uh, a clinic nearby, so on. And that is very different from how Emil Fahim is crowded or Rahat or any other uh, refugee camp. So we need to put that in the context of how a space, uh, not only your living and how many people share the apartment and so on and uh, uh, 
the access to mobility. Uh, can you, uh, if you start from uh, any town, can you, uh, can, do you have a chance for mobility, for uh, also social mobility, but living in another city and moving out and choosing where do you want to live? So in Israel, we can see clearly the Jewish community can choose to live in a crowded city or in a kibbutz or in a communal and so on, versus the Palestinian that are just locked. You know, if you're from Mipaham, you would just stay there. You, would not, you have very little options to move to other towns. Yeah. And one other point, too, about the, the diabetes situation, even in the most recent years, post-Oslo, you know, in the West Bank, you know, you have such high rates, you know, you're talking about really in a captive economy, and, um, you know, 80% of imports and exports are through Israel, and so you have a rapid uh, change of diet um, that was basically enforced through economic, you know, paradigms and through these agreements and a very neoliberal structural adjustment uh, programming and peace building and all these things that have happened just in the last 25 years. Um, on top of all the other things that we talk talked about, obviously with Nakba and occupation. And so you really just see, you know, all these compounded things that end up with things like diabetes, these chronic diseases. Thank you, Bram. Um, we have another one from Joel, um, that's from Moran, I think. Uh, what models are being utilized to decide upon the target audience and or the efficiency of Jewish Israelis uh, for bringing about change? Moran, you want to answer that? I need a question again, a written, sorry. Right. What models are being utilized to decide upon the target audience and or the efficiency of Jewish Israelis for bringing about change. Do you place your effort in a comparative context of the end of apartheid in South Africa, which includes to a large extent the involvement of international pressures? Yeah, I can refer to that question. It's a good one and very complicated one. As, and it reflects the situation. Of course, it is, uh, it is made of a lot of, uh, um, there are many uh, directions that we should uh, tackle the issue. Of course, uh, I think it should be, I mean, there are many models and it's not that we know if the model of South Africa or in, I don't know, uh, um, different kind of uh, similar situation, what will work here. But of course we think we should work on all the areas. We should work from within. We should work with the outside uh, pressure to uh, stop the occupation, to Israel to uh, take responsibility and to become ac accountable of its war crimes and its ongoing Nakba uh, uh, and ongoing colonial um, systematic um, uh, con um, behavior. Um, yes, I think it is layered and I think all those layers should be working. So personally, I choose to work in this area of working with is Jewish Israeli uh, public. Um, and I think it all should be combined. I mean, there is, all the areas are important to, to lobby the parliament, to work on a BDS, to work with the Israeli. Okay, there are like, I don't know, eight or nine million Jewish Israel. No, it's eight million, it's seven million. I'm not sure, sorry, but there are some millions of Jewish Israelis. They're not going anywhere. Maybe some will go, but most of the Jewish Israelis will stay here. We have to work with this, and for me personally, it's a personal choice. I don't think everyone should uh, we should speak with Israeli with Israelis, or everyone should pressure Israel from outside. No, I think everyone should do what they find uh, uh, helpful for them. Also personally, this is my personal choice, and as a, and I think as the com the committee of return, the fact that we are we decided to make this committee. Uh, as Jewish Israelis, we, this is our mandate because uh, also I invite you to read the paper. 
it's not too long. Uh, and it's, uh, we, we say in the beginning, we first, the first thing we write that we acknowledge uh, that the Israeli society, even without, not in regarding of with the Palestinians, uh, the Palestinian, the Nakba, or even the Palestinians we, who are citizen, Israeli citizens, which are highly discriminated in so many levels. So even if we put this aside within the Jewish society in Israel, it is so um, uh, torn up, so many discrimination, so many oppression within the Jewish uh, society. So we have a lot of layers to work on. I hope I... Um, answer the question. Thank you, Moan. Yeah, may, may I just add to that, uh, just to complete what Moan said, uh, the, the, the unique work of Zakhot is to work um, within our communities here uh, with Jewish Israeli society. Um, of course, the Palestinian struggle is led by Palestinians um, and is helped by uh, co-conspirators uh, as Bram described, all over the world. And this is important, crucial work uh, being done all over and international pressure is essential uh, to end apartheid, to end colonialism, uh, to end um, Israeli occupation. Um, but the change in Jewish-Israeli society is just as essential, uh, as Moran said, millions of Israelis are probably going to stay here in, under any scenario uh, and they need to change, we need to change, we need to take responsibility from the crimes uh, we are done on or inher inherited uh, from the, for the crimes we are doing now uh, and take responsibility for our future here so it can be a shared and equal future. Can I add everyone. one more sentence, Rachel? Uh, yeah, we, we just have another question, real quick. Um, yeah, there was a question, I don't remember who asked that, about what is uh, Zohot's stance on, uh, on Aliyah. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess it means Jewish Aliyah, or Jewish immigration, and uh, the, the right of every Jew from all over the world uh, to uh, to return to Palestine or the land of Israel, which is uh, the lands below uh, right now. And of course, we object that. Uh, it's absurd that people who have been exiled from here 72 years ago cannot, under any circumstances, come back, whereas uh, people who have never been here get automatic citizenship. Uh, that's injustice. That part of colonialism, the whole story of Aliyah uh, from the beginning of colonialism um, has been used to, to drive Palestinians off their lands and obviously we oppose that. We think that the law should change. Please, Moan. Yeah, I would also, I would like to add um, a positive point of view for the thing about Israelis to take responsibility or to um, uh, to hold ourselves accountable as Israelis and as the state, of course. Um, so I think it's not only a something, a way to right the wrong that we did to another people. I think it's, a, it's good for us. It's healing for us. I mean, I don't think anyone wants, not maybe not anyone, unfortunately, but people, most of the people don't want to be occupiers and they don't want to um, uh, uh, oppress people uh, and to colonize people. And it's, it's, a, it's an opportunity for, for, for us to change and to heal and to, to choose differently and to live differently and to have our children uh, raising up differently and to walk the streets and uh, demil demilitarize our society. I mean, it's, a, it's an amazing, optimistic, positive 
a beautiful opportunity for Israelis. I mean, it's for me, it's so obvious. <laughs> I mean, this is really, this is why I really wish and dream that the return will happen also why. Thank you. And yeah, I think we will end uh, with this hopeful note. Uh, thank you all so much for joining us. Uh, again, uh, if you want to learn more about our work, check out our website. Um, follow us on Facebook or Twitter to learn about future events. Uh, we have uh, events, tours, uh, right now, virtual tours, we hope to be on the ground again uh, soon. Um, commemoration events for the Nakba and uh, events to reimagine and plan return. Um, if you want to support us, you are very welcome. If you want to support Bram's fantastic work, please go to uh, Health for Palestine. Thank you so much. Uh, please keep fighting for Palestinian return. And we'll see you next time. Thank you all. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you for having us. Thank you, Sama. Thank you. Thank you, Moran. Thank you, Sama. Thank you, Bram. Thank you, Moran. Thank you, Rabbi, so much. Thank you, Rabbi. It was very amazing. Thank you. Thank you.